Facebook Live. It'll be right at 5.30. It's not real. It'll be right at 5.30. Check, check, check. One, two, three. I don't everybody else probably has their mic check. This is Ty. This is Ty. We sound good? Yes, no, yay, nay. Looks like we're getting close. Yay, okay. You cannot hear anything. I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to keep talking. You're not hearing anything. I just heard it on my, my end. Fine. I, I, you guys are you guys are breaking in, in and out from my service.
Check, check, check. Testing, testing, yeah, testing. Yeah. yeah. Sound check, one, two, three, four, five, hello, hello. Sound check, sound check. Mic one check, mic check, one, two, three, four. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check, one, two. Sound check. Sound check, one, two. Sound check, one, two, three, four, five, six. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to speak to you all today to address the death of Jamal Sutherland that occurred in our detention facility January 5th of this year.
First, I would like to extend my sincere condolences and, and apologies to the Sutherland family. My heart goes out to them and I will continue to do everything I can on their behalf and be available to them. Thank you to the members of the community that have patiently uh, waited for, uh, for us to, to come forward and talk about this, uh, a, the investigation and the process that we're in, and I appreciate your patience in that. Some of you may or may not be aware that I walked into the doors, these very doors to your left and to my right, in my full capacity as sheriff three hours prior to this tragedy. However, I knew coming into this position that changes needed to be made and that we, that is what we've been doing for the last four months and that's why I ran for sheriff and that's what we're going to continue to do. My goal is to be completely transparent while ensuring there is also due process and justice afforded to all parties involved. I've done my best to respect the process to the Sutherland family by adhering to their wishes in a signed agreement that has already been seen and, and uh, viewed by the public. I will continue to work with the solicitor's office, SLED, and the family's counsel, as well as our counsel, to resolve this. Currently, the officers involved, I know you, there have been a lot of questions about that, and I will, and I will address that. The uh, officers involved are in an administrative capacity pending the outcome of our internal investigation. Our internal investigation is currently underway and we're working towards a timely conclusion. I want to answer questions, but I need to re respect that process. And I anticipate that this investigation will be concluded soon. Per our, con our current policy, I suspended the officers involved and I had 30 days to make a final determination on their employment status. At the conclusion of that 30 days, SLED still had not finalized their, their review and I didn't have all the answers. And at my discretion and based on my policy, I put them back on administra in an administrative capacity. They essentially have desk jobs pending the outcome of this investigation. They do not have any contact with any of the residents of our facility. I know there is a concern and a lot of questions regarding excessive force that is completely understandable. What you've watched on these videos is not easy to watch. Unfortunately, in our line of work, we see it all too often. There were directives in place at the time that the detention centers acted upon those directives. And one of those directives were they were forced to go to bond hearings. That was their, that was their directive. That was their policy at the time. Since that time, since that day, I have changed that policy and no longer allow forced bond hearings. Residents can absolutely refuse their right to a bond hearing. I wanna be clear about that. We have invested funds at the detention center in, into purchasing tablets and creating a wireless network with in-house that allow our officers to bring the bond hearing to them instead of the bond hearing coming to, to them coming to the bond hearing, which was the, the case before. I wanna to talk to you about some of the things that we are doing now that we've been doing since January and, and actually since before I was sworn in. We are having an independent assessment done on all of our policies and procedures, more specifically, the ones that, that uh, are cause higher liability, use of force, our traffic, our driving, uh, things that could cause harm to the community. This is also true at the detention center. So this is being done as a, as a holistic approach to look at what we have to make things better. I cannot speak for the Sutherland family, but based on our ongoing dialogue, I am hopeful that they will be engaged in legislative efforts surrounding mental health. And I wholeheartedly support those efforts uh, for the family and for all of our residents that suffer from mental illness. The day, two days before I came into the to, to be sheriff, I met with uh, the providers, the, the, the medical providers at the jail, and we implemented a no missed meds policy. And what that means is if we have a person that comes into the facility and they are on medication and we know they're on medication or they have medication with them, the, the, the nurses and the doctors at the facility can, can take that medication, clear it through their medical provider, 
and they can administer those medications. To expand that, if they leave the facility, we give them about three days worth of, of medication. The breakdown now becomes the continuum of care. We cannot force somebody to continue care. All we can do is offer that service. So, some additional things that I think you need to know we plan to do. I think this is something I, I did initially when I first came in is we uh, implemented a, a group to review policy and, and to review uh, after action reports. And I am requesting an after action report and after action review involving all of the, the, the facilities involved, the providers involved, and the law enforcement involved so that we can make sure we get this right. We're developing policies and procedures for mental health. We're working on that, but we need help. We need professional input. We don't have all the answers. We'll be leaning heavily on our legislators and our county council, our community partners to make these things possible. And I want to just tell you, our county council over the last four months has really worked diligently to get us the, the additional funding that we need on our new facility, the, the new juvenile detention facility, because when it was designed, it didn't include these services and we were adamant that we needed space for these services and they, are, they have worked with us and they're providing that and I'm sure, I know they're committed, they've been committed uh, since I've been here. And we're working on restricting the non-lethal force aspect of persons in mental, with mental health crisis. That is a work in progress. We have to make sure we ensure that all the people involved are safe to include our officers. I know that you guys have a lot of questions and I just want to remind you, I'm here to answer questions, but I will tell you, this is an ongoing investigation, internal investigation. I will not jeopardize the internal investigation within our agency and I will answer any question you have to the best of my ability. Two questions. Um, are there <clears throat> crisis intervention uh, staff, mental health, you know, trained staff at the detention center? Were they, and if so, were they in place in early January? Uh, and kind of part two to that, the two deputies um, who are on administrative duties right now, were they, um, were they members of I'll, 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 answer, I'll answer the first question and then we'll go back to the second question. Uh, the question is, what, what is, there, is there mental health professionals on staff? Specifically at, crisis cri Not crisis, there are mental health professionals. Okay. We have a mental health professional assigned to the detention center through our provider, uh, the medical provider. Uh, the, do, were they on, on, on duty that night, you said? I do not know the answer to that. I do not know the answer to that. What he's asked is, is it typical for this to happen for somebody to be removed from a mental health facility? I can't answer that, but I can tell you I've never seen it in my 32 years. So I know it happens and it has happened, but it's not happened to me personally. Uh, there, there's a reason they're there. Sheriff, when it comes to training, um, what are the deputies here trained in terms of using a taser? Because obviously anytime someone uses a taser, more than five times that's usually sort of a bridge too far in a lot of jurisdictions. What are you telling your officers now? I'm sure the taser is still deployed. Has anything changed policy-wise when it comes to the taser so far? No, nothing's changed policy-wise as far as the taser being deployed, but when you're saying use the taser five times, was the taser effective? Were the prongs placed properly? Uh, was there an effect? And we don't know the answer to that. The investigation should reveal that. When it comes to trust, you know, obviously, community policing, it's all about trust. I see you have community members behind you. What are you asking the public right now to trust you guys in when it comes to this investigation? I'm asking you to trust the process. Trust the process that we have in place. Uh, understand that we are making changes as we, as we can and as we see fit. And we are aggressively doing this. This didn't start, this didn't start January 4th. This started before we got here. 
we already had a transition team in place. We were already identified issues that we knew were of concern to us. It was not a, it was not a, uh, a secret uh, that that the SOG team, which you were referring to, was one of my concerns. It, that was not a secret. We we have uh, retrained. We brought in a new trainer uh, to, to train and to identify any deficiencies in training with that team. It's now called the Emergency Response Team, and they're they're trained specifically to handle combative pe people. And and we get that every day in the in the detention facility. I think one deputy was one uh, dep Sergeant Fickett was a prior member, but she was not on that team. She came to assist. Okay. Yes. Sure, if there's any questions regarding the supervisor of the detention center at the time, was the previous person fired? Was a new person put in place? I mean, can you kind of walk me through what that looked like on January 5th? On January 5th, the yes, the uh, the, the the current director that ordered those directives was terminated. What is the process for? Sure. Fernando, you said it, process, due process, and we have to follow not only due process, we have to follow the law and the policies that we had in place at the time. And I will, I will respect the integrity of that investigation, and I won't interfere with it. Trust me, when, it, when the investigation is done and complete and we make a determination, you all will be the first to know. Yeah, I, I'm going to assume that is that is what why they did it because they did have a policy in place. So any other agencies, NTPD, Mayor Kisami, the police for office, all throughout the day have put all the blame on you and your department. You spoke about your first day on the job with deficiencies. What um, what led to specifically the reveal of this video? Right, we heard today from the family attorney that the solicitor was the one who revealed the video to the family last Wednesday, I believe they said. Uh, how does this dynamic all play out? Because it seems like everybody is trying to wash their hands out of the responsibility in a bigger system that is problematic. It, so it sounds a little political. You know, that, that sounds like a system that has been in place for a while. Um, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'll take responsibility for what we can take responsibility for. So I'm not pointing fingers at what and second guessing what other agencies did and, and didn't do or what they failed to do. Uh, our responsibility is the safety of, of Jamal Sutherland and he died in our facility so we need to examine that. Sheriff, when did you get to see the videos for the first time? What was, I guess, maybe your first reaction when you see them? I, I don't recall when I saw them, but uh, I, like everybody else, I, I'm in this line of work. Uh, we, see, we see things like this all the time. Um, I'm, still, I'm still horrified. It bothered me. And for transparency, you and I have talked about the budget for a long time, divestment of funds. Are you willing to publicly call on Charleston County Council to fund some mental health programs that are separate from law enforcement agencies so that they're able to handle this? Yesterday, your statement said that uh, it, throughout your career, you've witnessed that officers are not well equipped to handle these situations. Can you make that call to the county council? Yeah, not, not only to the county council, because they do, they do approve our budget. I need to ask for it, but I need to have specifically needs for it. And so that's what I need help with. That's where the community can help us this, def define what we need in that facility and how to get it there. Uh, right now we have a, a contract with a, a medical provider, and that's WellPath, and they provide that service. But it's not enough, Fernando. We have 750 people in there, and we have one, one mental health professional. And it's just not enough, and we need more. You know, all I can do is tell you that we're going to put measures in place to protect our residents of our facilities, and we're going to do whatever we can to make that make that happen. That goes for our, our community as well. Uh, when I hear people talk about, uh, you know, wanting to go out and protest and 
and have their voices heard. I understand and I respect anybody's individual right to, to peacefully protest. Um, and that is their right and I agree with that. Um, I've done it a few times myself, okay? But as your sheriff, it is my duty to, to serve all of our residents. And, but let me be clear, let me be very, very clear. I will not tolerate acts of, any acts of violence against our citizens or our residents at our facility. And, and I will not, uh, any acts of destruction uh, will, that, that jeopardize the safety of that community or my residents of the facility. tell you that my response, the response that I've gotten from, from the people that were involved in that, uh, it's been a breath of fresh air. This is somebody that's highly skilled, highly trained, and, uh, and relates really well to people. And he's, he's actually he's standing. In front of you. Really well. Oh, where is he? Mike, Stan oh, Mike Stanley in the green. He's actually right here. So after this, you're, you're welcome to talk to him as well. All right, that, that's going to conclude the interview for now. Um, I'm sure we will provide more information as we can do so, uh, but thank you all for coming. Thank you.